I am a 23 year old second year journalism Centennial College student who is avid in creative writing, audio and video editing. I came from a family of five from a mixed Indian, Caribbean, and Filipino ethnic family background. I am also the eldest of two younger sisters. My dad was the glue to keep in our family tight knit and enabling us to stick by each other as well as looking after one another always through thick and thin. This reminded me of my own personal experience of bereavement and the stages of grief during those times of lockdowns during the COVID-19 pandemic. It has been four years since my dad left this earth to go up in heaven in a better place free of pain and suffering. At the same time, it made me feel sad deep down with losing such a loving and caring fatherly figure, soul, and companion who has always been there for me as much as he can growing up. This podcast is in honor of my dad and loving memory of him. This episode is a safe space where I share my personal experience of learning to navigate my world of grief and cancer after losing my late dad junior to stage for pancreatic cancer in February 2021. Hey everybody, this is your host Shalina Singh from Scarborough, Ontario. Welcome to the first episode of my podcast, The Missing Link, where people who are grieving after they have or already lost a loved one to any type of cancer are all invited to listen to this conversation. In this episode, Rachel Enstrong joins me as a special guest as we discuss what it is like to navigate a new life around the world of cancer and grief how finding a creative outlet can translate as a cathartic outlet around honoring a loved one and finding ways to live around grief. This episode will be aired on my YouTube channel at shalinas.1219 as well as any podcast platforms you listen to other podcasts. Please subscribe, leave a review, and share this episode of The Missing Link with friends and family if you enjoyed this episode. My guest, Rachel Enstrong, is a cancer care health educator who has a master's in social work, has been a guest in over 56 podcasts, and an author of her first book titled Wife, Widow, Now What? As a young widow, Rachel has been vulnerable in revisiting and sharing her personal experience with the world after losing her late husband, Grayson, to lymphoma since April 2013. As well, several of her works aim to empower people who are grieving that they are never alone in this painful dark battle. Now I will turn the floor over to Rachel to share and to talk about everything about her facing the unknown of the cancer world that she was suddenly thrown into as a young woman. She tells us that she did not notice any other alarming symptoms before her 35-year-old hardworking husband, Grayson, passed away. Grayson was only showing signs of paleness and fatigue. She assumed this was from his constant exhaustion at the time from working until 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. in the morning. Eventually, a trip to the doctors revealed a tumor and that this persistent fatigue was part of his leukemia cancer diagnosis. You know what? No. He was always like really overworked. He was the only person that did his job. Um, So he, he would, you know, was supposed to work from 3 to 11 p.m. and he worked more like three to sometimes one or two in the morning so like he was exhausted but that seems like it was just regular exhaustion from you know work and life and things like that so no we didn't really notice anything unusual and he'd always been kind of pale um so just assumed it was kind of fatigue from work yeah kind of the same thing with my dad too like i think since 2016 he battled like back pain and he thought he pulled a muscle. So that time he didn't really know about like the symptoms of pancreatic cancer and cancer is really a funny thing. It is, it's interesting. I don't know how, but his doctors were able to tell like he'd only had it in his body for like two weeks or something like that. Um, But yeah, it is, it's very interesting. She believed at just 28 that this was impossible for her late husband Grayson to be diagnosed with cancer at the young age of 35. They believe that they were indestructible. Nothing can really prepare you for this moment, and Rachel had to learn to accept Grayson's cancer diagnosis. I feel that cancer is becoming more rampant among young adults and even people of different ages. You just have to go with the flow and only make your loved ones feel comfortable in their quality of life. I didn't even give it a second thought. It was kind of like, okay, I'm 28, he's 35. 
we're gonna live forever right you just when you're young you don't think things can touch you like he didn't even have um long-term disability insurance at work because i was like i'm 35 i don't really need that and i just remember thinking like okay 2011 is gonna be fine and we're getting because i had broken my wrist at the very beginning of 2010 falling on ice here in minnesota and i was just like oh you know 2011 is gonna be fine so i hadn't really repaired re or prepared myself for anything because I just assumed, you know, you when you're younger, you just think you're un indestructible. So you're just kind of ignorant that, oh, yeah, bad things can happen to me too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I felt the same way too. I thought my dad would overcome his cancer, but he didn't. He passed away at the age of 59 when I was only like 20. Mm. So it was really, pretty hard for me. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, it's not natural. It's not supposed to happen. You can't really prepare yourself for that. The news that Grayson had acute lymphoblastic leukemia was shocking for him. Rachel describes those first few weeks since his official cancer diagnosis as surreal and very robotic. She just learned to take each day one day at a time as she can only hope for the best for him. Both were unable to start their own family early in their life and were advised by the clinic to save their eggs and their sperm if they wanted to have kids. I think he was actually in shock. Um, and it was really awkward because it's like you're young and then they want you to save either your eggs or your sperm so if you want to have kids someday. So it was like, oh, okay, you have cancer. We need you to go to this clinic on the way to the hospital and all of these things. So I think... I feel like the first few weeks, everything was just really robotic and surreal. Um, it was a shock and it was more, okay, we have to do this. And you don't really think, um, you know, you don't really think about work or, oh my gosh, I'm gonna miss work or how are we gonna pay for life or how are we gonna do all these things because you're just so shocked um, at that happening. So I think, um, he was just, it was almost like, you know, when you're at the airport and you're on that, that, um, the walkway thing where you can yes, either I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it, we were just kind of like on this walkway, like, uh, <laughs> just taking it as it came. It was just, it was really weird. Very bizarre. Grayson was part of a clinical trial in pediatric care for acute lymphoblastic leukemia. This clinical trial eventually got him to remission. Rachel was thankful that he was well taken care of by doctors and nurses who closely monitored him. He was offered the initial trial in the first weeks when he got sick. There were. So he was in one that um, he had acute lymphoblastic leukemia and he was in one that um, was specifically usually for pediatrics. So it, it was like from birth to like age 21 is what they normally did. And then he, they said, okay, we want to try it 21 to 35. And he was 35 when he was diagnosed. So he was in that. Um, and I, I liked it because they watched him like a hawk. But <laughs> yeah, that was the one that he was in. And um, I mean, it, it got him in remission. And, you know, it, it did the job of what it was supposed to do initially. So yeah, he was in that. And he got offered that within the first couple weeks of getting sick. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately for us, um, we were really desperate because that's when the COVID-19 lockdown started. So we were really desperate. So my dad had to try vitamin C and a whole bunch of stuff, but it's it wasn't working for him. Oh. And he just became weak over time. Yeah, I'm so sorry. That's really tough. Rachel worked eight hours every day. This did not stop her from visiting Grayson for a few hours in the hospital. The hospital where Grayson was staying back in January 2011 was only 25 minutes from where she lived. She managed to push to and thank God for helping her during this unknown period of her life into the world of cancer. She was also not afraid to ask her parents to be the caregivers for Grayson. She did not experience much psychological physical and emotional collateral damage until her late husband was stable in the summer of 2011. Rachel just kept on going. She thought about herself as the team captain 
and the manager to take care of her husband until the end of his life. When she brought up the fact how she coped with this mindset, I shared how I am currently coping with spoken word poetry around my grief on YouTube around my dad. She mentioned that my spoken word healing outlet on my YouTube channel will be a time capsule to watch and reflect on. We also talked briefly about real life analogies of how similar the grieving process is like putting salt in an open wound. This real life analogy of putting salt in an open wound represents the outpouring love, pain, and grief of when we miss our loved ones. The wound only opens again during the special occasions when we find it hard to celebrate or get true without them. I definitely had reservoirs of energy I didn't know existed. Like you just, you have to keep going. You don't have a choice. I would work like eight hours a day, then um, go home, let the dog out, then drive to the hospital, which was like 20, 25 minutes away. In the winter, it was a lot, <laughs> it took longer than that. Um, and then I'd sit with him for several hours and then I'd come home, you know, barely pet my cats and dog and go to sleep and kind of rinse and repeat. And it, um, when I, you know, think back on it now, I, I have no idea where that energy came from. To me, I think it's all God that helped me through that. But, um, I don't really think I felt the like collateral damage of all of it mentally, physically, emotionally until um, I'd say like the first summer after he was in remission. So when he was sick in January, 2011, like that summer, just learning, you know, when he was more stable, being able to nap more or sleep more, those types of things. Like you really just don't realize how tired you are. And I think mentally, I wouldn't necessarily say I was numb to all of it, but my role was to be like the team captain and the manager and, you know, make sure he had what he needed and get got him places. And thank God my mom and dad came and helped as well. But I think um, I lived up until right before he died, I lived like he was just going to be fine. And I think that was ultimately what worked really well for me as I I just kept going and didn't really think about it because it was just like, okay, it's my job. I have to do this. And I did. Yeah, the same thing with me too. I have a YouTube channel, which I do spoken word poetry and it's around my grief around my dad and it's been helping me a lot. So I'm doing the same as you, um, sharing my experience with people. You'll have to send me the link for that. That sounds awesome. I want to see it. Sure. So yeah, that, that started in my last program in 2021. I was introduced to an, uh, to an assignment, so I had to create my own YouTube channel, and ever since, I've been continu continuing it. Isn't it amazing how just kind of working on it, it's so healing, and you're just like, it is, yeah. wow, and even like years from now, because it's been 10 and a half years for me, but years from now, you'll be like, man, how did I do that? <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool when I, once I look back at it, like how much I've um, done. Yeah, and it'll be like a time capsule for you as well. It'll be really neat for you to have someday and realize, um, I think a big part of, maybe you'll ask this, I don't know, but a big part of, of healing is being able to, so when I have tough stuff happen now, I'm like, okay, the ladder, or the, or the the ladder or I want to the ceiling glass ceiling or whatever it is like I've already shattered what anybody should have to go through and so have you so when you have tough tough stuff happen you're like I did that I of course I can do this you know I think it it helps with our resiliency for sure yeah I think about the grieving process as like a putting salt in a wound and then it opens up like in special occasions and it's like when a baby learns how to walk so it's it's little baby steps like the bad days like the wind opens up again and then the good days it closes up so that's how i think about like the process of it yeah that's a, that, i love that that's really interesting but it's totally true when asked about how his friends family and how his co-workers describe grayson she was more than happy to share with me about her husband's family background and his mannerisms like Rachel's late husband, me and my dad shared similar traits of being soft-spoken, 
generous, caring, and a reliable person for anyone who needs help. My dad would sacrifice his time to go to great lengths to drive me and my family out to the mall even though he was in so much pain. We were like two peas in a pod. We very much enjoyed each other's company. I remember that he was also a, a very family-oriented person who liked hosting parties, family get-togethers, and his music to get everyone dancing on these special occasions. Um, very, very kind. He would do anything to help other people. Um, he was almost too, like goody two-shoes nice. Um, and he was just, he, so his parents, his mom was from Texas and they're very, very Southern manners and everything like that. So he was just always super well-mannered, super kind, super nice and generous. Yeah, that was my dad too. He was really caring and all the people he met, um, including my teachers, um, they really loved him. Oh. I'm so sorry about your dad, by the way. Thank you. Rachel's remarks of Grayson's shoulder shaking whenever he laughed was hilarious. This reminded me that our experience of grief have a silver lining. Remembering those good and funny times of your loved ones helps to curb the feeling of depression and anxiety since they are not here with us physically. So he was tall, and what was really funny is I didn't realize until after he died, um, and I was trying to date again. He was six two, so I just assumed every, all, you know, I didn't look at everybody else. And I was, so now I'm like, wow, he was really tall. He was really tall. He would walk like, I'd see him walk, and I would like when I met him the first few months, I thought that he walked kind of funny, but he actually had like amazing posture compared to the rest of the world. He had really long hands, um, and when he laughed, his shoulders would shake. If he laughed, I can really imagine really. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite funny. Yeah. 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 Stay tuned, folks. We will be right back after the break to hear more from Rachel. Her brother, who was 14 years older than Rachel, informed her mom that she shouldn't talk about Grayson anymore. She also shouldn't mention him anymore since she remarried after her late husband passed away. Even her sister, who is two years older than her, also doesn't like when Rachel brings up Grayson. She mentions that toxic people like her mother-in-law can pull you down while you are grieving and during the bereavement process. Her mother-in-law was unable to give up going to church on that day to visit Grayson when he was in the ICU for the first time since his diagnosis. She had several toxic people in her life and instead chose to filter out toxic people. She does not have the time to deal with any negativity. Many of her best friends and her dog passed away before and after the pandemic. This made her view life in a new lens since she knew she could get through the grief once again after losing Grayson after 10 years. That's a good one. Um, I'm going to fast forward to now. I found out, I actually cried because I was so mad last week. I found out that my brother, who's 14 years older than me, has informed our mom that my husband now shouldn't have to hear hear me talk about my late husband and my past life. And it's like, well, I'm a cancer care health educator at Anthem, the insurance company for work. I've been on like 56 podcasts. I post things online. I have widows reach out to me. I have all of these things. And I think that's the really tricky part is I ha I've had a lot of people rally. Um, I think my parents get it more than anyone because they were there and they helped take care of him with me and they were a part of it. Um, my mom told me in the same conversation last week that I learned about my brother as well. Um, my sister who's two years older than me. So it's me. I'll be 42 soon. I have a sister who's 44, a sister who's 54, and a brother who's 56. So the sister that I grew up most with is two years older than me. My mom said, I think it's not that she thinks that you should stop talking about him. It just hurts her heart. Like she, it, it feels bad. And I think that's the toughest thing with family and friends 
um, is you don't really know what to do. You don't really know what to say. So sometimes you just don't say anything at all. Um, but it's one of those things where it's a, it's a catch 22 and it's bittersweet because I'm glad they don't know what it's like to be me. And I don't want them to know what it's like to be me. Um, but at the same time, you can't always really get adequate support. So it's tough. It is I tough. Mean, I'm, so, I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> Thanks. And I'm fine now because this is, you know, something I speak about. And I actually spoke to a grief and loss group shortly after Christmas. And it was funny because it was at this church and I showed up and it was at a grief coalition here. And everybody, um, so I'll be 42 in April, but I say I'm 42 now, but I'm late. I'm there. I'm 41 and everybody's like 65 or older. And I'm thinking like, oh, okay, they're going to be like, how is this girl related? Yeah, to that's kind of weird. <laughs> Yeah, and I told them that um, so my best friend had a neurological disease and he was kind of slowly withering away. Like he withered away. I, we were really close for like 20 years. He withered away down to like 60 pounds. So he died in June of 2002 and then, or excuse me, 2022. And then in December of 2022, I, after another really good friend that I learned that I was my coach during the team and training marathon stuff for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, she withered away and died as well. And I helped take care of her, her home. And then my dog died the following April. And it was funny because I'm at this grief and loss conference and, or excuse me, I'm speaking to this grief and loss audience. And I'm like, my best friend died. And then another close friend died. And then, and then when I say my dog died, then they're all like, oh, like it's not even the people. Yeah, it's that's such dog. a coincidence, like how fast that happens. Yeah, and I really feel like in the cancer community, it's, sometimes it just feels like it's dominoes, you know, once you know somebody. Um, but I, I think, I of course wish I could take away his pain. I hate that he had to go through all that. I hate that, you know, I lost him. But at the same time, for better or for worse, I think I'm a better human. Um, the way that I, I see the world and I feel my ability to help people when I, you know, I know I've said my age several times, but when I was 31 and I took them up life support two days after I turned 31, by like that summer, I was like, whoa, I'm 31, but I'm really like 50 with what you know about the world. And I don't know if you feel that way, but it's almost like you have this vantage point. You didn't ask for it, but you can see life in a different lens. And I think appreciate people, appreciate things, but you're also able to say, oh, okay, well, I even have that still with possessions 10 and a half years later, and it might be the rest of my life where I'm like, oh my gosh, well, so specifically, and you might have, it sounds like you read my book, or maybe you listened to a podcast, but specifically yeah, I listen like- to, I listened to two of your podcasts, and it's yeah. really good. Thank you. But like his cat became diabetic six months after he died. And I said to myself, like, well, you had, if you could put your husband down, you can put the cat down. And that sounds really crass, right? But once you do that, like I was saying earlier, you can do those other things. And I think, oh my gosh, but I really love this book or I really love whatever. And I'm like, well, if I can get over a spouse, I don't need the book. I don't need the whatever. And it's really interesting how you can see life differently and I'm sure you'll have, if you haven't had those already, I'm sure you'll have those, a lot of that with, you know, thinking about your dad and things like that. It's just even, you know, friendships or jobs or things like that where you're like, okay, I can get through it. I've done it. I'm, you have these invisible muscles that are just building. And even though it sucks that you had to do it, it's pretty cool what you end up coming out with. Yeah, I've experienced that. Um, that's why I'm studying what the program I'm currently enrolled in. Um, I hope to do okay. creative writing after I graduate. I bet you'll be really good at it. Thank you. Yeah. That's a really good question. And that's kind of funny because I just finished with my husband now this DVD that I bought from a Christian bookstore that's like toxic people in your life. <laughs> Literally, I watched like the last two sessions last night. I think we all have toxic people in our lives and we sometimes write it off as like, oh, you know, that's them or that's whatever. Um, specifically in this big circumstance, I had a really rude mother-in-law. Um, she was a narcissist and it was just really all about her all the time, her needs, her wants. 
um, I remember telling her that he was going in the ICU for the first time and she had some obligation at church. She lived an hour and a half away. She had some obligation at church and she was like, well, I need to go do that because I said I would and then I'll come over. And I was like, are you kidding me? So I think it's, you just have to be able to filter people out and be okay with that because your job is to make sure, I mean, as you know, helping with your dad and everything, your, your number one job is of course, it should be taking care of yourself, but making sure that you can advocate for them when they can't and you do that. And then once you get through that, the neat thing with, um, and this was another thing that I talked to, talked to that grief group about a couple weeks ago is as awful as it is to go through these types of things, being able to, we get the gift of being able to choose. We have those stronger muscles. I was just talking about, we get to choose who we do and we don't want in our life to support us. And I think that I've had several toxic people or friendships or different things that I've had to cut out. I had a friend that was like a best friend for like 12 years. She was close friends with Grayson as well. And I was supposed to be the maid of honor in her wedding. And I, you know, had, so he died in April of 2013. She got engaged that November. I had an engagement party for her at my house in the house I used to share with like my dead husband. And then I say that in these terms because, you know, I, the following January, I went to a wedding fair with her and it was just, it was torture. It was like knives being thrown at me because there are all these like women with their rings and they're excited and all this stuff. And I was just like, okay, my person's dead. Like, this is not fun. And then um, she just started getting really judgmental and told me, um, cause I was taking a break from working and, oh, you need to get back to work. And, oh, you, you know, my brother, um had said around that same time you just need to decide to be happy and things like that and um yeah you can't stay happy it's really hard yeah and it's one of the things is like so at this point in my life after these types of things like i like when my best friend died in june of 2022 i was at a grief conference and i was supposed to go i woke up at like what five in the morning his sister I'm friends with Paul said he was gone um that he died and then I drove to the grief conference just kind of in a daze and I was the executor of like his will and you know needed to go through his apartment and do all these things and I sent my brother a text that said that he died and I was at a grief conference and he sent me a heart and a thumbs up emoji and I was just horrified so I think it's just I've he, he loves me and he cares and I love him. And I don't think he's toxic, but I think what's toxic is if I were to believe that he's someone I can emotionally invest in, like I can't, I'm just going to end up getting hurt. Um, but I do think, you know, I've had friendships and different things like that because when you go through something as traumatic as what you and I have been through, you don't really have room for people that are going to be judgmental or you don't really have room for people that um, can't give you appropriate support. And what's really neat and what I try to talk about, and I'm not sure if it's something you've heard on one of the podcasts you listened to, but um, we get that gift in choosing who you want to let in. I've had like a couple jobs in the past where I worked there quite a while and then people didn't even know that I was, these were just short term things during my widow years, you know, to make ends meet. But I had one day I said something and this lady was like, I would have never known you were married. You're so positive. And it's like, well, that was kind of where I was. And it's easier than like opening up this, putting the salt in the wound. Right. So you can, you can, you can do those things. And I think that, um, you know, I have an extremely toxic situation right now. Um, the biological mother of my stepdaughter is an extremely dangerous sociopath narcissist who completely tries to wreck our lives. And it's, it's an extremely monumental um, stress financially and things like that, trying to fight for this kid. But I feel like the toxicity from my former mother-in-law at least prepared me, I'd say 60% for this. So it's really interesting, just the, the trials of what we go through. And I know I'm filtering back to the same thing again, but um, it's amazing what 
something like this can prepare you for. So when you are faced with that toxicity, you kind of are like, you know what? I don't deserve that. And I'm going to take this space for myself and I'm going to do those things. And again, out of something so negative, that is kind of a positive. It's like being your own cheerleader with your hindsight. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I think about myself um, like now. My dad used to be a cheerleader in everything I do academically. So it now I miss him because it's getting close to his death anniversary, um, February 19th. So I'm feeling that right now. Yeah, yeah. What was his name? Uh, Junior. Junior. Rachel's creative outlet of writing her first book was an emotional roller coaster. This allowed her to express her voice of her painful experience of losing her late husband to leukemia on paper. Um, I didn't realize how much I needed to get it out on paper. So it wasn't all alone in my head. Um, there were so many different pieces of, um, I guess I would say like trauma in PTSD. So writing my book was definitely, I'd say, a labor of love and PTSD. But I don't think I realized how painful so many pieces of it were. And even when I cry today, thinking about what I went through, even just talking about it now makes me feel a little teary, <laughs> that what is what blows my mind is it's me it's me it happened to me but it seems like it's like so far away so far um you know I have his name tattooed on my wrist and I have pictures and I have people in my life that were there and saw it and have known me through all of it but it's hard to believe that it was me and writing it down was like confirmation of whoa that was you, like all the nitty gritty pieces that um, there were so many pieces of it that I forgot. So having those um, Caring Bridge posts and Facebook posts and all those different pieces um, when I therapeutically wrote but updated people seeing all of that, um, I just kind of, I knew it was bad, but my job was to survive and get through it. But then when reading about all of those pieces and remembering that's where I was, and then every time I would edit the book and things like that as well, um, it was just, it was almost shocking to say like, wow, that was me. And I'm here today. Like, how did I get here? You know, it's just, it's, it's really it does tricks with your mind. Yeah. I feel the same way too. When I look back, I, I, I'm surprised at myself. Like, like how I write too, it, it has really improved. Yeah, yeah. It's neat. It's a, it's awful, but also a pretty cool gift. Rachel has enough content to write a second book on her ongoing notepad of ideas. Instead of writing another book, she wants to get her personal experience of grief of using social media platforms instead to reach more people. Um, you know what's crazy is I'll show you like, I have this ongoing notepad that's enough for like, so I just have like all the time in my, my first book I have, I wrote most of it, most of the like money shot, amazing analogies, quotes and all these different things. Um, I always think of it right when the lights are out, right before I fall asleep. So I do have a lot of material, but I'm thinking of, um, other ways to get it out there besides writing another book, maybe reaching more people. I was even thinking, um, I was like, so I used TikTok only once when I was raising money a few years ago in this campaign for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. But I'm like, how do I reach more people? My whole thing is I don't want people to feel less alone. So I'm like, maybe I just put on dresses and I'm like sitting like a cocktail hour and I'm talking about me. Like, I'm serious. <laughs> But yeah, it's just, it's, um, I do, I have a lot of material. I have a lot of things I think you would enjoy, um, such as I have one that's like, um, let's see if it's right here. Um, I don't have it readily available, but it's like, grief is like having, a, I, I love my analogies. 
grief is like having um, a coworker with really bad breath. You can, yes. I, yeah, you can try, yeah, you can try to, you can, you know, hand out mints and gum. They may take it, they may not, but you're going to have to figure out how to live with it. You have to. Um, it's definitely, you might have heard this on the podcast, but I really like the analogy of like, it's a roller coaster. Once that bar goes down, you oh, yes. Up. Yeah, you have to ride it. And I think that that's okay. Um, definitely, I think so many people stuff down grief and then it bubbles up in the worst ways later. So it's something that no one really asks for, but the grief community is definitely really beautiful. There are a lot of people that want to help. Thank you to the listeners for checking in and tuning in to this first episode of The Missing Link to listen to my conversation with Rachel around the culture of grief and cancer. This is your host, Shalina Singh, signing off.